The scripture reading this morning is from Galatians chapter 1, verses 13 through 23. For you have heard of my previous way of life in Judaism, how intensely I persecuted the church of God and tried to destroy it. I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my own age among my people and was extremely zealous for the traditions of my fathers. But when God, who set me apart from my mother's womb and called me by his grace, was pleased to reveal his son in me so that I might preach him among the Gentiles, my immediate response was not to consult any human being. I did not go up to Jerusalem to see those who were apostles before I was, but I went to Arabia, and later I returned to Damascus. Then, after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to get acquainted with Cephas and stayed with him 15 days. I saw none of the other apostles, only James, the Lord's brother. I assure you before God that what I am writing you is no lie. Then I went to Syria and Cilicia. I was personally unknown to the churches of Judea that are in Christ. They only heard the report, the man who formerly persecuted us is now preaching the faith he once tried to destroy, and they praise God because of me. The second reading is Psalm 100, verse 3. Know that the Lord is God. It is He that made us, and we are His. We are His people and the sheep of His pasture. Shall I pray? Father, thank you so much for this time. And please be with us. Pour your Holy Spirit onto us, onto us. So may we understand your word and apply it to our lives. In your name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> You know, in the year 1946, a young shepherd named Bohamat Fahit and his two cousins were poking around in the wilderness called Kumran in the land of the west bank of Jordan River. And they stumbled into a cave where they found seven carefully wrapped scrolls and other fragments and actually the seven scrolls and uh, fragments were in an ancient jars seven ancient jars and then the the ancient document and the the script turned out to be the old ancient uh, bibles and other documents and it was most likely stored by the ancient and strict Jewish community who lived in the late, maybe last century of AD or BC or first century of BC. It was incredibly and significantly and fine because before the discovery, the oldest manuscript was dated 1000 AD. So the new manuscript that they found was 1,000 older than the recent one. The date of the, the manuscript is much closer and closer to the original writing. We now call this manuscript the, the Death Sea Scrolls or Kumnan Scrolls because the place uh, they were found was Kumnan next to the Dead Sea. And most scholars, without any fail, found that these Kumnan, Kumnan scrolls were very identical with the recent the manuscript. I mean, 1,000 years of period, but the Kumnan manuscript, and the 1,000 years later, they found another script, they are identical. It means that those who copy the manuscript did an unbelievable job. They didn't make any mistake. They didn't make any error. And after the discovery, after the discovery the some, some other Christian archaeologists found 11 more uh, caves and found over 900 uh, other texts and manuscripts in Hebrew, Aramaic and Greek. 
This is very uh, important findings. You know, actually, when you go to Denver, uh, Denver Museum of uh, Nature and Science display the ancient document now up until September 9, I think. It's once in a lifetime. Actually, you can visit there if you have time and see Kumnan and script. For 2,000 years, the most valuable manuscript remains silently in the cave. For 4,000 years, about 2,000 years, the most valuable of Bible script were forgotten in the wilderness. I believe God put them in there and sealed it securely. And when the time came and he inspired the young shepherd and find the manuscript, I don't believe that it was an accident. Everything under God's control. So the young shepherd found the manuscript in jars. You know, the, the place of the cave located on the top of a rock. I don't know how you know, 2,000 years ago the people could access the place carrying you know, heavy jars and all those manuscripts. God opened it by three young shepherds. It was God's timing for us. So we can see that the scripture that we are reading today is accurate and permanent and real. 2,000 years, only God knew where they were and what they were. The Paul was forgotten in the wilderness for three years. He went to a desert called in Arabia and was completely forgotten and erased in memory by those who he knew him. You know, Paul was not what he used to be. Paul's name was not Paul neither. He was a Saul. Like he was a Pharisee of Pharisees, Jews of Jews. He was a member of a Sanhedrin. And today, he might have a couple of different PhDs. He has all the religious and political power. Then on the way to Damascus to arrest more people, God interrupted his life and made his life upside down, out of blue. You know, that's what God does sometimes. Sometimes God interrupts our life, makes our life upside down, you know, Paul didn't ask God to come into his life and change his life. God just came in his time, in his way, and made everything upside down. Before being found by the Lord, Paul was a sort of raging bull, standing proudly in you know, the fighting battles. He's persecuting followers of Christ in the name of God. That on the way to Damascus, God changed him, made his life upside down. So God called Paul to be his disciples. But the interesting part is that God didn't call Paul to his ministry right away. Paul didn't initiate his ministry right away. Instead, in today's passage, verse 16, Paul went to Arabia and stayed there for three years. To me, it's sort of strange and odd. Because when God calls you, you want to do something for the Lord. You know, people say, Mike, you are very talented, you are very gifted, so why don't you go to seminary school? Why don't you go to you know, Bible college? Or why don't you join a church ministry? But the Paul, he was called by the Lord, but he didn't initiate his ministry right away. He went to a desert in Arabia and was completely forgotten for three years. You don't need to be confused that the Arabia is not a place in Saudi Arabia today. The location is a wide range from Syria and to Egypt. It's not a place like a desert city, Dubai. The Arabia 
It's a barren land. It's a barren wilderness. Nothing there. Everything seems to stop. Everything seems to be quiet. No one lived there. Only a few animals and few plants. That's all there in the wilderness. And the Paul was there all by himself. You know, Paul used to be surrounded by bodyguards, surrounded by many people. He had religious authority. He has a political power. He could do whatever he wanted to do. Now he found himself living alone in the wilderness and forgotten by all people who he knew. That's where in Arabia. The most important thing is the why. Why Paul went to Arabia being forgotten for three years. You know, whenever the scripture is silent on a subject, many scholars and theologians try to fill in the blank with many theories. Ancient fathers believed that Paul traveled to the desert in Arabia to bring the gospel to a savage group living there. Other scholars believe that Paul actually fled to the desert to protect himself from some Jewish leader who found out Paul had a new faith. They wanted to kill Paul. That's why he ran away to the desert. Another theory is that Paul needed the same time that the 12 disciples had with Jesus Christ. You know, Jesus Christ wore his 12 disciples for three years. So Paul wanted to have the same amount of time so he can verify that he is true Christ disciples. But the truth is, we don't know why. Only thing Paul says in today's passage, after three years, he went to Jerusalem and stayed with the Cephas for 15 days. For three years, Paul lived somewhere in the desert, cut off his formal manner of life in loneliness, solitude, and obscurity. Do the math. It's over a thousand days. He was alone in the desert, praying, meditating, thinking about the Lord, and wrestling within, inside. What am I doing here? Was the real God who I met? Is this really God's calling? For three years, I'm pretty sure he was struggling with his calling. If one time he was captivated by his own spiritual significance, the self-inflated pride was melted away in the warmth of God's hand, in the warmth of God's calling at the desert, all by himself. I'm convinced that in the barren world, Better land, he developed his theology. In the land of obscurity, he met God personally, intimately, and silently. He experienced the unfathomable mysterious of God's election, authority, and the power of the resurrection, and the church, and the future thing. I'm pretty sure he learned many things while he remained in wilderness, while he was being forgotten by many people. It was three years crash course in the desert that changed Paul, a soul into Paul and equipped him with a lifetime teaching and writing and preaching. Most important part is he tossed aside all of his political and religious credentials for the real relationship with Jesus Christ. That's why Philippians chapter 3, he says, 
Whatever things were gained to me, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. More than that, I count all things to be loss in a view of the surfacing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. In the wilderness was the training place that he learned about God, learned about himself, learned about human depravity, learned about the church, and learned about his ministry. He was forgotten, but there was the most valuable time in his ministry. Afanti Kim Poo, we call just Kim Poo, you may not uh, know the name, but you, I'm pretty sure you have seen the picture, the most you know, famous and horrif horrifying pictures taken in 1972 in Vietnam. And Kim Poo was at the time nine years old, you know, running naked and crying on the road, you know, having burned by a, at the time, the bomb, the bomb is a nephil, nephil bomb. Once it explodes, it just, the fire came out. So she, her back was burned. On that day, her family died, her friends died. She had third degree burn on her back and didn't expect it to leave, but she did. She was survived. For years, she struggled with those people who caused such a mental you know, physical pain. She couldn't sleep and she couldn't eat for 10 years. Then on Sunday, 1986, in a small church in Vietnam, she was all by herself and praying. Then she was found by the Lord. And that's the moment that she began her profound journey of healing and learning to forgive and go deeper in her faith. She lives in uh, Toronto, Canada, uh, Toronto, Canada, and she wrote her a uh, book and she says, I could never forget the day of suffering. But I realized that there is nothing greater and more powerful than the love of Jesus Christ. She understand she was not really alone in the wilderness. She realized, she realized that she was God, uh, God was with her along the, all the way she suffered, along the, all the way she was all by herself. You know, not many people have the wilderness as a king. But we all, no matter who we are, have some sort of circumstantial a wilderness that brings us a sickness, loneliness, fear of losing our job, fear of losing our family, even fear of death. We are all in a circumstantial a wilderness. The matter is, it's inevitable. No matter who you may be, no matter how old you are, how young you are, what kind of job you have, we are all in a circumstantial a wilderness. The important part is that how you deal with the wilderness. We can go either one way or the other. You can turn away from God, you can turn away from others, or you can turn toward God, turn to other people. You isolate yourself from God and other people, or you ask for help and prayer. You join other, join ministry, join other Christians, join the fellowship, and ask them for help and prayer. Will you live in a large integrity, honor, and watch for God and see what He's going to do, or will you live in small isolation, or only watch for yourself and let the the wilderness is close in around you. You are all by yourself. You can go either one way or the other. As a follower of Christ, we have to choose a better way, the perfect way 
the Christ is with us. If you, are, if you think that you are in wilderness, we have to understand that you have God's calling is right there. God wants to teach you. God wants to reveal the secret that you have never known. In other times, you may not be understand what God has for you. That's why God puts you in the wilderness, circumstantial wilderness, so you can see what God has for you. Other times, we are caught by many things. We are distracted, distracted by many good things or bad things. That's how God pull you out of your busy life and put it in right here so you can only see yourself and God and discern what is God's will for your life. If you think that you are in the wilderness, you don't need to, elive, or you don't need to uh, uplift yourself more than what God designed you to be. God has a calling in our wilderness. The calling is simply be you. You have to allow God to be God bring the character, the character that God designed you to be. In the wilderness, God's will, discernment, his plan are right there. That's why Paul, Paul was there for three years. We don't know what he did. We don't know why he went there. But the outcome of his ministry, we can see God formed Paul to be the one who God wanted him to be. Want him to do. That's the wilderness. Wilderness of life. When we look at our lives, we face all different sorts of difficulty, all different uh, types of circumstances. Sometimes we have a great time, sometimes we have a bad time. The matter is how you see your life, how you face all those difficulties. Do you see your life from God's perspective? What do you see your life from your own human perspective? If you see your life from your own human perspective, things, all those things that happen to your life might not make sense. But if you see it from God's perspective, everything makes sense. That's why I'm here. That's why I'm doing this. It's God's will. He is calling for me. He is calling for me to be the one who God wants me to be. So turn your eyes on to the Lord and ask Him what His plan for you in the wilderness. You will find His great plan for your life. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, if it is necessary for us to go through a wilderness so you can make us be who we need to be, who we, the person that you want us to use, you want to use. Help us strengthen our spirit and mind and continue to walk our journey in faith. Help us not to lose our focus on you, Lord. In the wilderness, teach us your way. Mold us to be a secure person in faith. And use us in a way that can bring your kingdom on earth. In your name we pray.